One of the problems we have in language is what we might call horizontal word transfer. Horizontal gene transfer is a big topic in evolutionary biology these days, and it means that genes are easier to track than lineages for many reasons. And the same thing is true, of course, with words, because there's a lot of switching or anastomosis between languages. Words in Norwegian, which come from English, words in English that come from Inuit or from Spanish, even those languages parted company in the trees long ago. Words are more trackable items than whole languages. Well, in 1975, Richard Dawkins introduced the concept of memes in his famous book, The Selfish Gene, as cult cultural items analogous to genes or to viruses, differentially replicating things that evolution could be the true theory of, even though they didn't have proteins, even though they weren't alive. Now, memes has had a rocky history. A lot of people hate the idea which is very different from dismissing it for good reasons. They just hate the idea, <laughs> including a lot of biologists, I found. So um, part of my task these days is to get biologists to rethink their dislike of memes. Sometimes they'll say to me, well, I don't even know if memes really exist. And I say, do you think words exist? How many of you think words exist? <laughs> How many of you are not sure that there are any words? <laughs> well, if you think words exist, then you think memes exist, because what words are, are memes that can be pronounced. Now, one of the points that is made always about evolution is that for evolution to occur, copying must be high fidelity, but not perfect. If it were perfect, there wouldn't be any mutation. So are there any memes? Yes, as I say, memes are words that can, words are memes that can be pronounced, and they are copied, and they are they are literally descended. Every word in your vocabulary is descended from a word that you heard, or maybe several times when you were younger, which descended from other words, and we can go all the way back in principle on that. Now I want to show you just how high fidelity language is by showing you that it does something that genes do too, and that is, it's digitized. Now what do you see? You see the cat. But look more closely and you'll see that the H and the A are actually the same symbol, exactly the same shape. You automatically, competently, involuntarily, unconsciously, without comprehension of what you're doing, you correct. You correct to a norm, you use context to correct to a norm, and this is what preserves fidelity in written language. The same thing also occurs, though, in spoken language, and is more important. Writing is a very recent technical innovation, but, but language is much older and, and much more, uh, uh, spoken language, much more important for my story. So I want to demonstrate to you the digitization of language spoken language by doing a little a little little experiment. So ready? I want you to listen very carefully and then repeat after me. Are you ready? Yeah. <coughs> Mundify the epigastrium. Mundify the epigastrium. Again? Mundify the epigastrium. Again? Mundify the epigastrium. Perfect. What does it mean? <laughs> It doesn't have to mean anything. In fact, it was what my mother's lawyer used to say when he came over around supper time and he wanted a drink. He said, I think it's time to mundify the epigastrium. <laughs> Meaning, to soothe the lining of his stomach. I don't know why he thought bourbon on the rocks would do that, but uh, that's what he said, and I remember that from childhood. And I remembered it perfectly! long before I knew even what anybody meant by it. And the reason is, of course, that it's made up of phonemes. So now we're going to do the second test. Are you ready? Again, repeat after me. Again? <laughs> no, you can't do it. Now, it's not that your ears suddenly went bad, or that I spoke softly. 
It's that you did not have norms of correction for those sounds. You didn't have the automatic norms of correction that let you involuntarily categorize all those sounds as particular letters. If you had them, then you would get it just as clearly as mundified the epigastrium, and you'd be able to repeat it. The amazing thing about language, and people all the time when they talk about language, they're always very impressed with the fact that we can understand it. And of course that's true, and it's very important. What's really important about language, though, is that we can transmit it even when we don't understand it. In fact, it's the digitization of language that permits us to divide labor and use verbal and other formulae without having complete understanding of them. Norms of correction. Oh, let me just, I'm going to give you another little example of this. E equals NC squared. How many of you believe that? Come on. How many of you understand it? Yeah. I'll tell you, uh, I used this example once in a talk at Fermi Lab to an audience of 250 of the world's best physicists and engineers. And so I said, how many of you under believe it? They all hands went up. How many of you understand that all the hands went up? And I was saying, well, you know, this isn't really the right audience for this example. And the fellow stood up and said, no, no, it's the right audience. The experimentalists only think they understand it. We theoreticians are the ones that really understand it. And, and, and he was right, I think. And it was a beautiful illustration of the point. We have this division of labor where we can do the believing, that is, we can, we can have a pretty good idea of what something means, and we've got a formula to cling to, a memorable, unforgettable formula to cling to. We can even use it, and we leave the understanding to other people in another discipline. This is one of the keys to our success. But it's been around for a long time. Um, information about kayaks is stored in Inuit brains, of course, but it's also stored in kayaks. But only on the presumption that the design is good. We have correction of the norm here, too. I've been using this example for some time, and then Peter Godfrey Smith showed me a beautiful quote, which I'm going to pass on to you. Not about Inuit kayaks, but about Polynesian canoes. Every boat is copied from another boat. It is the sea herself who fashions the boats, choosing those which function and destroy the others. If the boat makes it back to shore, it's a good boat. <laughs> Copy it. You don't have to know why it's a good boat. You don't have to know, understand the principles of why it's a good boat. It's here. It's good. <laughs> so here we have cultural selection, natural selection, working on something which is an artifact, for heaven's sakes. Uh, this, is, this is natural selection, but not of genes. Now, if I had time, I would argue that memes are like software viruses. In fact, I would argue that they are, in an important sense, software viruses. But to understand this, you need to adjust your imagination about both computation and software, and that's another lecture for another time. So I'll just pass over that, and then uh, remind you that here we had the traditional inherited treasures model, and I want to compare it with the mimetic Darwinian model according to which culture is composed of good, bad, and indifferent things, created by processes with variable insight, sometimes a great deal, sometimes none at all, and adopted with variable recognition of value. Sometimes people pass on things they don't, they positively dislike, they positively hate, they despise, but they can't keep from copying them. Like that terrible jingle that you can't get out of your head, and you hum it, and then your friend picks it up and is angry at you for passing it on. <laughs> 